Everybody knows that that first year after you get out of NP school and start working are rough. There are a lot of hurdles and bumps that occur along the way, and you may or may not make some poor decisions that lead to some good stories, but probably not the best decisions you can make in that circumstance. It's a rough time, but in this video, I'm going to talk you through how to mitigate the problems that you're going to encounter when you transition from the bedside to functioning as a provider in your first year working as an NP. I'm going to offer you some techniques that you can apply to mitigate some of these growing pains. And at the end of this video, I'm going to answer that burning question that everybody asks, which is how long does it take until you feel competent? And it's usually followed by how long does it take until you feel confident? So I'll answer that at the end. My name's Bree. If we haven't met yet, I'm a nurse practitioner. I make content for nurses, NPs, and students. Welcome. Well, first of all, I have to say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. At the time of this recording, it's a couple weeks before Christmas. I'm trying to get in the spirit here. So I've got my little tree and sign up there. 2020 hasn't been exactly the celebratory year that it should be, but we're still trying to have some holiday spirit around here, and I hope you are as well. Let's talk about imposter syndrome. It is legit real, y'all. It is exactly what the name implies. It is an internal belief that you are not as competent as others perceive you to be. And you see it exhibited in people who are high performers, lots of self-criticism going on in these kind of folks, people that hold themselves to a high standard. So the fact that you have it speaks volume about the kind of person that you are. But I will say that most everybody goes through this. It was first studied in the late 70s in women in positions of authority. And since that time, it has been proven to be present in all genders, across all walks and all professions, but it is still very predominantly seen in women in positions of authority. And given that we are a profession of a lot of women, obviously there's gonna be a lot of this thing going on. We're all gonna hold ourselves to a very high standard and when we don't meet that, we have a feeling of being a fraud. I'm sure that many of you felt this way when you graduated nursing school and you first get out of school and somebody asks you a question or you have to make a decision for a patient, you have to go start an IV, do something and you have no clue what you're doing, but you kind of pretend like you know what you're doing so that people don't realize what all you don't know. It's just like that when you graduate NP school, except magnified because now you are the person that people are coming to with questions. You are the end stop. And when you're new, especially if you don't have a ton of time at the bedside before you went back to school, you don't have a ton of experience to draw on. And when you're asked all of these questions, you have to make all of these, these decisions that you don't know the answers for. You have to stop what you're doing, do a literature review and figure out what the evidence-based answer is. And it doesn't always come very quickly when you're new. So you're constantly interrupted during your day. And so you have this internal fear of, oh my God, somebody's going to ask me something. I don't have to make a decision about a person's life. And it's going to be awful because I'm never going to finish my day and I can't focus on what I'm doing. But that is part of what we do. And this anxiety blankets like the first six months, year, even two years of your career. The good news is as your competence and confidence grow, this feeling is eradicated. So I no longer have imposter syndrome. I have decision fatigue, which I think has its own DSM classification. And I think all providers across all specialties would tell you they all have this because you're constantly having to make choices all day long. And it doesn't create a sense of anxiety from a place of, I don't know the answers, which sometimes it does, but not all the time like it does when you're brand new. What it creates is a sense of angst over the risks and benefits. You know, everything that we do in medicine has pros and cons, and you have to constantly weigh the balance of those two. So when you make a decision, sometimes they're minor, sometimes they're very, very major. They have consequences. And is the consequence worth the risk to your patient? And that weighs on your conscious because you are now, you are now the person responsible for the outcomes. It's not the bedside nurse. It's not the pharmacist. It's not the respiratory therapist. The buck stops at you. We are a team, but I think every single person I've ever met who goes through graduate programs and becomes a master's prepared NP feels the same way. We all feel a very um, large amount of burden for providing safe care for our patients. So it's there, it never goes away, but you get better and more adept at handling it. 
And typically you just walk in the door at the end of the day and you say to your family before they even look at you, don't ask me anything. I don't wanna make any decisions about what we're eating for dinner or if you can go to a sleepover tomorrow. Just know that decision fatigue is real. It changes in etiology from the early phase of your career when you don't know the answer to the late phase of your career when you're burdened by the consequences of your answers. The good news is there are things that you can do to make this time frame in which you have this imposter syndrome go by quicker. And the first thing is to set up a proper orientation. Now this is going to vary based on where you practice, how quickly they need you to be up and running, and who is doing the orientation. So establish the outcome measures that will be used to decide whether or not you're ready to come off orientation before you even start. Sit down with your lead or whoever your director is and determine at what point do you think I'm going to be competent and safe to practice without someone orienting me. Just kind of know that going into advance and try and set up time frames throughout your orientation where you're evaluated on how you're doing. Now what you do during your orientation time frame is what is going to segue us into Tip number two, which is developing superior organizational skills. <laughs> and the reason is, as your efficiency increases, you will open up more time during your day to make those hard decisions. You will feel less pressured. You will have more time to do literature review. You will have less pressure during your interactions with your families and your nurses because you won't have as much urge to get back to whatever it was you were doing because you're so very behind because you've been inefficient or you've been spending too much time researching what you need to do. Overall, you'll just be less overwhelmed, which will reduce your stress and increase your confidence and sort of allay some of that fraudulent feeling you have going on that you don't know what you're doing because you have more time to figure out what you're doing. How do you do this? Well, the first thing is, Look around your service, okay? Just look around, watch people, listen to people. Who's good at what they do? Who's got the best reputation? Who do you see that is working and you're like, man, he or she is like, they are just rocking it, they are really good. And copy them, it's real simple. Watch what they do, study what they do, emulate them, copy them, do what they do. How do they organize their day so that they are very time efficient and what do they do when they don't know what to do? Some examples of how you can specifically do this. Number one, I made a video where I talk about ICU daily flow where I lay out how I organize my day. So go check that out for if you want some ICU examples. I think another good example is ER. All right, if you're working as an ER provider, so much of your day is spent taking history and doing review of systems, which is why I don't do that because those Ugh. you have to talk to people and then they don't uh, they don't answer your question they give you way too much history they ramble on and you're like oh my gosh the clock is ticking I've got 20 other dispositions to do and all these patients waiting on me and that's all you're thinking about when they're talking to you so find the provider who's very adept at getting to the heart of the matter and cutting out all the extraneous talking <laughs> who's able to like walk out of the room without listening to this long drawn out story and how they make themselves quick and efficient. If you're working in clinic, one of the big stressors there is getting to your patients on time and making sure you see them all. And on top of that, doing your notes as you go along during the day, because you don't wanna be there late every day. You don't wanna be taking it home with you. So I saw a lot of people practice differently when I did this. So find the people that you think are very efficient, that aren't staying late, that aren't taking work home, and see what they do. Because some of them are doing their notes as they go along, some of them do their notes during their lunch, their brief little lunch time frame, and some people just do it all at the end of the day. You just gotta figure out what flow works for the people who are good at what they do and how you can incorporate that into your style based on your personality preferences. The other thing, and I think this is maybe the best hot tip I can give you, you need to study the art of note writing just like it's a subject when you were in school. I'm, I'm y'all, y'all, totally serious about this. Invest time early on in your career learning how to write notes quickly and efficiently. Study it. I also made a video where I talk about note writing tips. I'll put up in here. Um, the best possible tip I can give you for being efficient at note writing is to sort out your EMRs, dot phrases or smart phrases, 
and set them up early. Establish those early because then when you're writing notes, all you gotta do is type in dot liver failure and it'll pull over this template and you just gotta boom, 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 change these couple little values, change this couple little things on the plane, boom, done. Move on to the next problem, boom, 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 boom. That's how you get quick. But you have to put some time into it early on. And doing that then is really gonna eliminate a lot of your stress when you're doing a note, especially if you're doing an admission and you're busy and the patient's really sick and they've got 10 problems and you can't remember what all am I supposed to do for liver failure? What are the things I look at for decompensated liver failure? But if you've got a smart phrase already set up that reminds you that you need to look for bleeding varices and hepatic encephalopathy, and these are the, the labs I need to send, and this is the data I need to determine how bad this really is because you can't recall all that stuff off the top of your head when you're brand new. But if you have it already written out for you, just boom, click it over, it's there, and it reminds you, oh yeah, I need to order this, and order that as you're doing it. It just makes you so much more efficient, which makes you quicker in your note writing, which frees up more time to get back to all of those other things we already talked about that you can do in a timely manner without the pressure of so much on your plate that still needs to be done. The next transition tip I'm gonna to talk to you about is your interaction with nurses. I don't wanna get into situations where I feel like I'm being a jerk, I don't want to get into situations where I feel like I'm being disrespectful to the nurses. I don't want to get into situations where they don't respect me or they don't believe me or they won't do what I ask them to. I worried a lot about this because I'm the kind of person that values relationships more than just about anything else. And I have a hard time asking people to do things. I tend to just go do it myself. So for me, this was a bit of a stressor. This may not be a stress for you, but for me it was. I worked as a nurse for the organization that I now work for as an NP. But I was, I was working at our sister hospital and I mostly work at our main hospital now. So most of the nurses that I got to know were new to me. But I know sometimes if you, if you work in a unit, these are your coworkers and now suddenly you're in a position of authority sort of telling them what to do. There can be a little bit of animosity there if you don't you know, go about it in a respectful way. And this was a fear for me. So I focused a lot on it. And, and the way I do it is number one, I never forget my roots. I never forget how hard it is to transport a patient for a procedure. I never forget how hard it is to set up all these lines for measurements like the flow track that I still need as an NP, but I recognize as a bedside nurse is very time consuming and they can't just do it like that. So I really think through before I order things like that, how it's gonna benefit me or the patient. And then I go the extra step to explain it to the nurse. Look, I know it's difficult to get to MRI, but I'm not gonna be able to have a discussion with this family about end of life care until I know how significant this stroke really is. And that's why it's important. And I find that 90% of the time that takes away almost all of any animosity or pushback that you might get. I think just being respectful and explaining yourself almost always gets you exactly what you want. The other thing that I really love to do is to ask their opinion. You know, Everybody wants to be a part of a team. You know, when you're rounding or if they're calling you with a problem, what do you think we should do? What do you suggest? They love that stuff. They feel respected. They feel that their opinion is valued and it goes a long way in relationship building. So you don't always have to leave the organization that you work for, but for some people in your personalities, you might need to. That just might give you a, a added bit of confidence to go work with people who didn't know you as a bedside nurse before. It depends on you as a person. The next hard thing is learning to work with doctors, your interaction with doctors. So you've always worked with physicians, but now you're working very, very closely with physicians as your colleagues. And there can be a lot of personalities in this game. So you have to become what I call a very good wife. You have to become a very good work wife, whether it's a woman or a man that you're working for. I'm just talking about your position. Um, Mid-level is not really a good term to use anymore because it implies that bedside nurses are not at the top level and the doctors are at the top level. So I don't like that term for that reason, but I kind of like that term because it kind of signifies where I'm at in life. I ride the middle. I have one foot in the middle of nursing world and I have one foot in the middle of physician world. And I gotta try and mesh the two together. So I have to become very good with my interactions with my physician colleagues. Some physicians are gonna give you full autonomy and they're not gonna wanna know what you're doing all day long. Some physicians are gonna want you to update them regularly. They may be the kind of person who wants to drive the plan of care and expects you to sort of carry that out. They may be the kind of person who just says, what do you think? Go do it, let me know if there are any problems. You're gonna have so much range of comfort with your level of practice. So the best tip I can give you for interacting with physicians is just being adaptable. Give them what they need. 
If they need you to be more hand tied to them, give them that. If they need you to be more autonomous so they have time to do what they need to do, give them that. One of my favorite books of all times is The Five Love Languages. And I think there's one for work. I read the one for spouses and for children. If you understand the personalities of the people that you work with, you'll be able to fill up their love tank so that they're happy with you and then they are able to fill up your love tank. So you start with giving to them. So if their love language is words of affirmation, then you tell them all day long, you are so smart, thank you so much for supporting me, you're very good at what you do, teach me this, you know, give them that and they will really love working with you and respect you more and give you more of whatever it is that you need. I think you should always 100% be honest with them. If you're not comfortable with something or you don't understand, you need to let them know that. I have yet to meet a physician who's not willing to teach me or explain to me what it is that we're doing. It's just a little different interaction from how we worked as a bedside nurse to how we are now working as a provider because what I'm doing is basically their workload. So they're a little bit more invested in your education. They're a little bit more invested in training you up. So never, never, never be afraid to let them know what you don't know. Find the physician on your team that you really want to be your mentor and let them know that. Look, I think you are incredible. I really respect you. I would love for you to teach me X, Y, and Z. I really want to learn this. So the next thing to make this transition easier is to figure out your learning style and continue that learning. Okay, what do I mean by this? You're like, Brianna, of course, I'm learning every single day. I'm looking stuff up. Figure out what the best resources are for what you do and then invest time in those. I love podcasts, so even after I graduated school, I would find a podcast that I liked. I like the MCRIT podcast, there's an IBCC, there's a couple others for ICU work. I would listen to those in and out of work. So if I had a day where I was learning to intubate and I did not do well with my intubation, I would listen to the Laryngoscope as a Murder Weapon series on MCRIT, which is Fabo, I'll put a link down below if you haven't. If you're going into ICU, you must, must, must listen to all four of those and memorize them, write them down, recite them to others and know them by heart because it will save you. But I would listen to those and just whatever it was I did that day that I didn't feel like I did well, I would learn on the way home and on the way in the next morning. And the other thing is to, you now have CME money. Use that money to go to a conference that's really gonna directly benefit what you're doing. I know this is sort of obvious and I don't need to say it, but I have to say it. Never stop learning and advancing your practice. Okay, so on to the two questions that all of you wanna know, cause you all ask me all the time and I asked everybody when I was new too, so I get it. The first question is, how long did it take you until you felt competent to do what you're doing? Okay, for me, it was about six months. I was no longer staying late. I was starting to feel more confident in the decisions that I made throughout the day. I was getting better with procedures and I was no longer scared to death every day that I was going into work. <laughs> when did I start to feel confident in what I do? Probably not until about a year in. At two years in is when I think you, your confidence truly hits. At about two years in, you feel like you've seen most of the things that you're gonna see and you have at least some knowledge base of what you're doing and if it's something that's rare that you don't see often, you know the resources to go to and you can pretty quickly get to some good decision making. Some of the factors that play into when you will meet these two milestones is your pace and your scope. For example, if you're working for a subspecialty like GI, your scope, the, the amount of problems you're gonna encounter are gonna be significantly fewer because you have one organ system that you're dealing with. And granted, within that organ system, you may have 10 different disease processes that you're treating. And you may have five or six different procedures that you're doing, but it's gonna be a more narrow scope. However, you're gonna be expected to see a lot more people. And that pace that you're working at, how you're able to get through seeing you know, 20 patients within a certain time frame so that you're not staying late, that's gonna be the piece that you have to master. Conversely, if you're doing something like what I do in the ICU or you're a hospitalist, your scope is going to be vast. You're gonna have all the problems you're gonna to have to deal with, but you're gonna have significantly fewer patients that you have to see. So it's a little bit more of mastering the scope of problems that you're gonna face than the pace. Sometimes it's both, sometimes it is the pace, but. Overall, it's more the scope that you have to master than the pace. So it's gonna vary a little bit based on what your subspecialty is. For all of them though, just recognize that this is a normal process that everyone goes through. 
There's not a single person I know that graduates nurse practitioner school that gets out and just rolls in the door ready to go. If they tell you they do, it's probably because they spent the vast majority of their clinical hours with that specific group. And so they're getting experience as they're doing clinicals or they're presenting a false front. <laughs> So what you're going through is normal. It will get better with time. Don't give up. Be honest with the people that are training you and be patient and kind to yourself. This will get better with time. Trust me. You're going to be the best NP you know real soon. <laughs>